Sup, freaks. This rip was brought to you by our good friends at River. River has a new referral program. Go to river.com slash TFTC for $5 worth of Bitcoin. When you sign up, set up an account and buy $100, you're going to get $5 of Bitcoin on top of that. River is the most secure Bitcoin exchange since they don't rely on any third parties. They built everything in-house from their wallets to their Lightning Network wallets. They also have zero fee, dollar cost averaging. Other platforms charge large fees and have giant spreads. Go with River to avoid that. If you set up your DCA, again, you're not going to pay any fees on those buys. River also has a relationship management team that's US-based and available by phone for you or your business. You can actually call River to get some customer support. It's a great value add that is hard to find these days. And again, they build everything in-house, including their cold storage, and all Bitcoin is held one-to-one in their multi-sig cold storage wallets, but they encourage self-custody as Bitcoiners. So the goal is to get you Bitcoin and to get it off of River into a wallet that you control. They build everything in-house. It's the most secure exchange. They've got free dollar cost averaging, and they have the new referral program. So go to river.com slash TFTC, sign up, and you'll get $5 worth of Bitcoin after you buy $100. Enjoy this rip. There's blockchain and shitcoinery in Ireland. There's blockchain, blockchain and shitcoinery in Ireland. Yeah, for sure. Um, that was one of the things that when I, because like I'd been here obviously for like over a year, and then I had to leave because I had to apply for my work visa, but I had to do it from outside the country. So I had to go back to Ireland to do that. So like I was going home for a few months and I figured, all right, I'll like, there's gotta be some like Bitcoin meetups. And I Googled it and it was just like blockchain and crypto meetups like all day long. I was like, fuck, there's nothing here at all. So- Are they well attended meetups or are they just? I have no idea. I have no idea. I mean, I didn't go to one, but like it was just like when you Google it, it's just like there's tons of them, like there's dozens of them just like every week. There was just like so many. And, uh, and I was like, there's gotta be some go- or like some uh, some Bitcoin stuff when nothing was coming up on Google. And I was kind of getting disillusioned, but then in January of this year, some random like Twitter account just formed. It was like Dublin Bitcoiner. And he's just like, oh, I'm sick of the fact that there's no Bitcoin meetups in Ireland, so I'm gonna start one. And I was like, oh yeah, nice one, okay, like this is great. So I immediately like DM'd him. I was like, all right, Zapparite's gonna sponsor it. Like, let's get this going. I'm gonna like send me an invoice, log into Zapparite, send me an invoice and I'll send you like some Bitcoin and we'll get it going, like a few hundred euro. Like, let's get you off the ground. We can give some sats out and like help people. And the guy said he was like sitting beside his wife on his phone and he's like, I think some guy's trying to scam me. He's, like, <laughs> he's telling me he's going to send me some Bitcoin and like, I don't know what's going on here. Um, Did you open it but, with, hey, sir, how's your trade going? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, sir, how's your trade? I'll send you some Bitcoin. Um, but yeah, no, that was Gary and he's like, he's been doing an absolutely like phenomenal job. He's basically, not only is he running the meetups, but he's like actively orange pilling a bunch of businesses, getting them on board. There's like, you know, a particular restaurant as well that we've got on board that we, we go to regularly for meals and stuff where you can pay in Bitcoin. He's got just local local businesses and services and like carpenters and plumbers and painters and everybody just like starting to accept it. Um, but the meetups are amazing. Like it's really, it's a lot of fun. He's got these like really cool games he comes up with at the start of the meetup that are like tied to like Bitcoin somehow. So one of them was like, you know, we had some swag to give out. So we basically just had everybody go around the room and like in a circle and guess a number between one and 50, you know, whoever guessed it, like obviously got the, got the swag. And that was the kind of like, you know, we would take mining and stuff like that in a, in a basic way, but it, like it started from there. And then it just like, he just got more creative and more creative with, with the, with the games and the stuff at the start. So like, it's really cool, but it's great. Cause like we get between 20 and 30 people uh, once a month to the meetups, like, which is, which is great for, and it's not in Dublin city. It's kind of like a little, like a little bit outside Dublin city in his kind of like local area. So to get that from the start, like has been, has been really good, but it's good to see for sure. Are people grokking it in Ireland? Obviously Gary and people attending the meetups, but Bitcoin as big as a theme as it becomes. I think definitely more and more for sure. And there's now a, cause there's like a, there's a bunch of Bitcoin companies that are starting up in Ireland as well. Like, especially you got like skilling mining and, and those guys and stuff doing like really great stuff on the mining side. You've got, um, there's another startup I, I met, um, a crew, uh, a couple of weeks ago from, uh, Sulu, which is basically using the lightning network to monetize like APIs for businesses and stuff like that. Um, so there's definitely businesses that are, that are like Bitcoin specific and, th- and they're doing it, but from the public perception, it's still a bit, 
you know, it's still all the mainstream like media foot on like, you know, boiling the oceans and all that like kind of stuff. But it's, it's definitely people are like, they're, they're warming to it more and more, put it that way. It's, um, it's definitely, there's a new, um, there's a new kind of like, I don't know if lobby group is the, is the right word, but like Bitcoin Network Ireland. And they're basically set up to kind of be, I don't want to say the spokespeople for Bitcoin because that sounds like kind of like cringe, but like basically they want to be there whenever there's any like government policies or anything that are like being discussed or talked about. They want to be there as like the voice of reason being like, well, actually, no, like here's the benefits of Bitcoin and stuff because, you know, otherwise who's going to do that? And um, we are like Ireland in general is just like completely going like way, way, way left. I just like complete like WEF country. And it's like, it, that's one of the things I've noticed since being back is it's absolutely nuts like what direction that country is going in and i don't like it at all um and it, it kind of scares me because like i'm kind of in that mode of like all right do i settle down in ireland again i haven't lived there for 14 years or do i like come back and live in austin now that i have my work visa and stuff like that so i'm trying to make that decision and at the same time like just like seeing what's happening in ireland is like kind of scares me like quite a lot yeah. is it happening in spite of what many irishmen want to happen or are people bought in on it no i don't think they're bought in on it i think they just kind of they're lazy and they don't really care it's just like apathy but there's you know for example there's like hate speech laws coming into ireland um where you know if you've got what the government considers to be hate speech like let's say you got a meme on your phone or something you've got to be able to prove that like you weren't going to send that on to somebody else and all you can be done for hate speech and all this kind of stuff and the government did like a little kind of uh I don't know what you call it, but they basically just did a, a, a pre-polling of the population to see like if this is what they wanted. And like 74% of Irish people said like, absolutely no way, this is ridiculous. We don't want hate speech laws. And the government basically just said like, oh, well, like we don't, we just do that to like keep you guys happy, but we're going to push it through anyway. Like, so I don't think Irish people want it. It's just, yeah, it's just a lot of people are just, they don't, there's a lot of trust in the government still. Um, and they just kind of like, they just kind of let themselves get like walked over. Like there's a lot of issues with like immigration and everything now as well. Like Ireland is just being taken over and most people, like there's, there's, there's rallies, there's people giving out, there's protests and stuff. But for the most part, people are just kind of, they're too busy just getting on with their lives. Like they don't care. But yeah. hate speech laws in Ireland. I mean, I'm of Irish descent. Yeah. Third yeah. generation American, yeah. but my ancestors on both sides came from Ireland and mm -hmm. very sarcastic bunch. Yeah, it's like this is the this is the crazy thing. Like it's the the Irish humor is is you know it's hard to get it's used crude. to it at the best of times, and now you're telling people that like they got to be politically correct in everything they say, which, you know, I mean obviously times have to change and there's some things you can't say anymore. But like that's just more people being decent people, being like okay, well like I want to be a good person, so I'm not going to insult somebody. But like having it brought into law is a completely different story. Like Being what, told like compelled speech, what you can and cannot say is just horrific by any standard. Like if I bring my Irish limerick book to Ireland <laughs> yeah, yeah. and distribute to somebody, am I distributing hate speech? Probably, probably. Yeah, <laughs> right? absolutely. <laughs> That's the big gift in our family. Our grandmother started that tradition. Oh yeah. When we graduate high school, she gives us nice a book of Irish limericks going back to like 1400. Yeah. Yeah. And some yeah. of those That's limericks awesome. are pretty yeah. raunchy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I can Politically imagine. Politically yeah, yeah. incorrect. Yeah, 100%. Like. Yeah. I can imagine there's probably stuff in there that you just can't, like, read out loud anymore. Oh, it's like, that's <laughs> the best part. Everybody gets a little wine drunk and pull out the limerick book around the table. And yeah, just yeah. Open up a random page and read a limerick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's yeah. Uh, it's great. It's great. But, yeah, there's probably a lot of stuff that in there that would be, like, censored and banned right now. It's like, you yeah. can't say that stuff anymore. But, yeah, it's... um. I mean, yeah, it's like, there's a, you know, it's not unique to Ireland. There's a lot of places that are heading in that direction, but it's just when you've been away from the country for so long and you go back and you see it changing like that, it's, it's like anything. It's like the frog in the boiling water, right? Like you, most people just kind of don't see it. They're like, oh, it's just a little thing. It's just hate speech. we got to stop people from saying bad things. They're not going to prosecute us. We're going to be okay. And, you know, I don't have anything to hide. So, you know, that old like chestnut but when you step into it after being away for 14 years, you kind of see the radical change, right? Like, especially, especially for Ireland, which is like, you know, we basically like 
fought the British and we kicked them out because we were like, hell no, you're not like taking over us. Like it was like it was just like Easter Rising in 1916 and all this stuff. It was just like we didn't put up with any of this stuff. And we're a very conservative Catholic country. Now I know the Catholic Church has had like a lot of crazy shit going on in Ireland, so that's a whole other story. But we've come from this traditional background and now to see people just be like walked over and like run by the WEF and they don't even care and all these like liberal ideas coming in and everyone's just like, yeah, well, we have to be more tolerant. So that's okay. Like, let's just let it happen. It, it's crazy to see it. It's like a complete U-turn. Like you can understand if a country was maybe already left-leaning and they just kind of got more left. Like Canada, for example, like Canada just seems like they've always been that way and now they're just getting like worse and worse. And, but Ireland as as hasn't really had that like attitude and now it's very prevalent yeah and bringing back to kicking out the british i mean this is essentially copying the british hate hate speech law implementing it into your own country yeah 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 it's like it's just crazy It, it just feels like i mean ireland has always been that way in fairness like ever since even when i was growing up like we always just copied a lot of things particularly that the british did like whenever stuff came in there like we would copy it and like if ever like you know bills or laws were passed it would be like oh yeah well that seems good we'll do that too so it was very much like you know they're our closest neighbor we'll follow what they do um so it, it's a lot of that continuing um but it just seems to be taken to a whole other level now where the government they're they're just brazen. They just don't even care anymore. Like, like I said, like, you know, doing a poll of the people is like 74%, like, absolutely no, we don't want hate speech. Like, yeah, we're going to do it anyway. Like, that's just like, you know, do you even, do you even have democracy anymore? It's like, it's just like, nobody cares. Like, no. Or maybe yeah. you do have democracy. It's just played it's out to its end state. And this is what the end state of democracy is at the end of the day. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, definitely. Like, I mean, I always like, I try to make that argument to like friends and family as well. It's like, look, the higher you go up in the levels, you're ceding your power to a higher and higher authority that is so far removed. And with countries and nation states, you got to that natural conclusion of like king or prime minister or like whatever it might have been or president. Like, and that seemed to be like the stop. And even that was bad enough because these people in Washington or in Dublin or in London, like they're so far removed from everyday life. But now it's like we've we've ceded the power one step higher, and now it's like the WHO and the WEF and like the IMF and like FATF and all these people like that, completely unelected. And so now, I've been making the argument for years now that there hasn't been a functioning democracy anywhere in the world for decades, when you really think about it. But a lot of people are like, "Ah, oh, you're crazy. We still we can still go out and vote, and like you know we fought for our right to vote, and we got to vote, and all this stuff." And it's like, well, what are you voting for? Like you're not you're you're voting for people. You're, you're voting for the person that you want to take orders from the WEF. That's what yeah. you're voting for. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, I want this person in because, you know, they'll, they'll be nice when they're being ordered to do what they're told to do. And it's like, all right, well, like, I mean, if that's how you think, then, you know, good luck. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Here's the scissors. You can cut your balls off right now. <laughs> yeah. Just do, just do it yourself. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, I don't know. It's, um, it, it can be... Yeah, I mean, it, it can obviously be depressing if you let yourself, like, get, like, sucked into it too much. But, you know, as you know, as Bitcoiners, like, we have this, like, bright orange future that we're, like, very hopeful. And we have this low time preference. Where, well, we can see what's coming, so we're going to make our lives better and we're going to go towards that instead. But trying to trying to instill that in other people, in friends and family and stuff, is it's hard. It's, yeah. it's very hard. Like you said, people are going along with their own lives they've got their own problems that they're dealing with on a day-to-day basis the economic situation globally is not uh Mm -hmm. good to put it plainly uh for many people people are under a lot of economic stress which leads to a lot of interpersonal stress in their own Mm -hmm. lives and the whole idea of having to think about uh, dealing with the political structure and trying to fight back against that just becomes too daunting it's like, hey, I got to fucking build a pay. Let me figure yeah. this out first. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's it. It's like people's lives are just getting harder and harder. They're getting busier and busier. And they just have less time to think about this stuff. And they just feel like, oh, well, if I just work a little bit harder and I get a little bit more money in and I then I can, you know, then I can be comfortable and I don't have to have these money issues or whatever, but completely not realizing that, like, it, it's never going to end. It's yeah. never going to end because they're, I think it was, was it Jack Mahler's that said, like most people are operating their life at a loss, like, and that's just going to continue because the hard, no matter how hard you work, 
if you're in the system, you're never, ever going to outpace it. Yeah. You're um, working hard for soft money. <laughs> yeah. You're working hard for soft money. That's exactly it. Yeah. Um, what's the economic situation like in Ireland right now? Is inflation as bad as it is? And yeah, I mean, inflation. Money? Yeah. I think, I mean, official numbers, right. Got up to like eight, nine, 10%, whatever it was like in most places, like similar, obviously, you know, the, the real inflation is a lot higher than that because energy prices were through the roof. Um, you know, I think, I probably saw you tweeting about that at some stage like months ago as well. You've probably seen it, the people posting their like photos on Twitter and stuff of their energy bills in Ireland, like, you know, 10 grand a month and stuff for bids, just like absolutely nuts. So, you know, people have been noticing it, but there's a general consensus in Ireland that Ireland is doing really, really well because we have these supposed really good GDP numbers, but it's all kind of fake because it's the foreign corporations that are generating this GDP, but none of it is actually staying in the country, staying in the country or benefiting the country in, in any way. It's like, and, and there's been a plenty of economists, even like Keynesian economists, like who have written about this because they recognize it. They're like, yeah, this is fake GDP. This is not real. Like Ireland is not doing as well as people say it is, but apparently we're the poster child for like, you know, oh, we went through this really horrible recession because Ireland got like hit really hard in like 08, 09. But we seem to we seem to bounce back really quickly. And now we have one of the strongest growing economies again, apparently. But again, it's all just, you know, fake GDP numbers. Um, but it's, like, it's obviously not sustainable. And now, of course, we've got like massive immigration as well, not just like Ukraine, but like like many, many nations, like African nations, everything, like they're all coming in. And we, as an EU country, we have to, I think by law, accept like immigration. So we can't do anything about it. And there's a massive, massive housing crisis in Dublin. Like people cannot, like young people cannot even find a house. And if, even if they could, they couldn't afford it. Like there's nothing on the market either to rent or buy. Even if there was, you can't afford it. Rents, like house prices are just absolutely nuts. There's more and more homeless people every single day. And yet we're just taking in absolute record numbers in immigration, which is like, I mean, now that I'm saying it, it just seems so absurd that like the government would be taking in all these people when we can't even take care of our own. But that's what's happening. And then, of course, most people are cheering it on. Right. They're just like waving the Ukraine flags going, yay, we have to do this because we have to like, you know, we have to take these people in because they're like fleeing from a war. And it's like, well, you know, how come they get through like six countries to come to Ireland? Like they're not fleeing a war, like, you know what I mean? Like the most of Ukraine is like still going out to restaurants and pubs and nightclubs. And even if you're fleeing from the bad war part, which is, yeah, it's terrible. Um, you, you're, you're not fleeing to get into Ireland. They're just coming because one, we have one of the most welcoming countries and we give them like, you know, crap ton of social welfare and free houses. We're building free modular homes for all the people that come in now as well. So like, why wouldn't we come? But we, like I said, we have to, by law, take a certain amount as well. So it just seems like we're heading in a, in a very bad direction, but again, not, not specific to Ireland. Like it seems to be, you know, every, seems to be every country. But one of the stats actually that came out recently was Ireland is the, I think it's the most expensive European country to live in with prices on average 46% higher than the EU average. Holy shit. Yeah. So think that's, about that. Like that's like 46% above the EU average. And yet we have all of these immigrants coming into the country who are somehow able to be fed and sheltered in the most expensive EU country. Like how, like how does that make sense? Like it, it doesn't obviously, but. You no, know, it does that, not that, compute. That's where we are. And then when you bring it back to like the GDP numbers, which I imagine are predominantly being driven by the apples of the world. Yeah. Like they're domiciled in Ireland because of the tax benefits, which yeah, are there because taxes are low. So taxes are low. They're not going back to subsidize this influx of immigration and the welfare that comes with it. So that doesn't seem like, yeah. it, 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 like nothing it, really computes here. Nothing does. And it's just so bad on, on so many levels because I talked to somebody um, who's as well, who was close to the, um, like the rental markets. And they're saying that like the likes of Google um, and, and Twitter and all these companies that are headquartered in Dublin, they're like, there might be an apartment that comes up and it's like 3000 euro a month to rent this apartment in Dublin city center. 
and you've got a lineup of like you know 100 people outside waiting to like view it and try and like get lucky and, and rent it and then you've got like google that just comes in and says like yeah we'll give you four grand a month for that apartment but just you know let the people line up and, and you know make them pretend that they, they have a shot and so like none of these apartments are ever getting to market because of these big multinationals are just paying way over the odds to like sweep them up um are they sweeping up to put their employees there or just to yeah 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 now that was happening up until i know they've put like a freeze on on um employees i know like in google and twitter and stuff they've they've laid off a bunch of staff in in dublin as well over the last kind of six to 12 months so like that may not be happening in fairness as much now but it's what has contributed to the situation that we're in now is that there was just literally like nothing like if you go on one of the biggest uh housing rental sites in ireland you know there's like you could like there's a handful of like apartments and houses for rent like it's it's crazy like that there's just nothing available like the supply is just gone but at the same time we're just we're bringing all these immigrants in and building the modular homes when our own like 20 year olds like coming out of college and stuff like can't afford anywhere to rent or live or families like young families trying to buy a house it's just it's backwards like if you were to explain it to somebody they would be like what the hell is going on like, better this- be careful john you're you're bordering on some racist hate speech here yes absolutely i'm i'm talking ill will of the government so that's got to be hate speech yeah, yeah. yeah for sure yeah, yeah. Yeah. Who are you to want uh, your fellow countrymen to be able to go and rent a house after college? Yeah, absolutely. That's a absolute right wing. Uh, <laughs> that's a right wing thought that I want Irish people to be able to afford a nice, comfortable house and and be prosperous. And that's yeah, that's a very right wing of me. I apologize. I hope uh, I hope I haven't offended any of your listeners. <laughs> no, this is great. I mean, I saw a TikTok video going around a few months ago on Twitter, funnily enough, but mm. I believe it was Galway or Dublin. It was one of those like men on the spe- yeah. uh, street interviews and mm-hmm. asking the question, what was the most popular name? Oh yeah, I saw that. Yeah. In, in Galway. Galway. It was in Galway, yeah. In Galway yeah. last year and everybody was like, Seamus or yeah. Kevin? It was like, no, it was Muhammad. Yeah, was like, yeah. And people were like shocked. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's nuts. Um, it feels like it feels like the Irish identity has just been wiped out. Um, it's, it feels like, and, and it's obviously like, you know, now you're bordering on replacement theory, conspiracy. All theories of that here. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I better be careful here. But, uh, but yeah, no, it's like it, you see, like I said, it goes back to like when you haven't been there in 14 years and you just land yourself back in after being away for so long, you can see all this stuff as clear as day. Um, and, and that's just an observation. Like we, um, we don't have to get into like all this, like, you know, what that means or who's behind it or what's happening. But like, it is an absolute fact that, you know, it's kind of, and, and you can't even talk about this stuff anymore. Right? Well, John, if you the, try and say like, well, look, they're wiping out like Irish national identity. And then it's like, oh, well, are you racist? You don't want these other identities in Ireland? And it's like, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying like, we're wiping out our Irish history. Like it's. Well, why is Irish identity worth even protecting, preserving? yeah the future yeah i mean that's that's the it seems like it's not most people just seem like oh why why would you like why do you care about that like you know what i mean it's like why no but you, honestly let's make the case like why preserve irish identity and culture well i mean irish people have contributed so much to to the world that like it just feels like there's a legacy that needs to be remembered that's like you know that's at the core of it i mean if you think back of um think back to like what the what the irish monks have done in transcribing like a lot of the kind of like books and stuff through history that would have been like lost like through the ages like in europe like they basically just kind of you know there's so much there even in the cultural aspect of like you know the poetry and the music and the writings and everything and and obviously like you know a lot of people have family connection like you know throughout the world because the irish have like spread so far across the world that like it feels like it feels like we're you know i don't want to get into the whole thing of like oh ireland's great but like it feels like we were a nation that's punched above our weight for so long that we have contributed a lot and a lot of it comes from it comes from our it comes from our history and our heritage and so if you destroy that then maybe you destroy a very strong a very strong part of a culture that has contributed so much to the world. Um, 
And so it's not just a case of like, you know, it's not just a case of like, you know, being proud to be Irish and stuff like that, because I've never really, never really bought into that as much. It's just more, it's just more like when a nation has a cultural history, it's something that they, they feel a very, very strong connection to. And it changes you in, in like, obviously like a good and powerful way. But if you don't have that, then, you know, you're kind of drifting. Like you don't have anything that you cling to, then you've got nothing to fight for and you've got nothing to be, you know, again, well, like I said, the, the pride aspect of it is not as much, but yeah, it's, um, maybe I'm waffling too much on that point, but like I, it's every nation has things that need to be nurtured and cherished because it's what made them the nation that they were. And obviously over time that like just gets stronger and stronger and that community like builds and builds. And if you just like start fracturing that and, and dismantling that culture and that heritage and introducing, you know, diversity so that you split all that up, it's, you're you're not doing anybody any good no when you take it to the extreme level obviously like you know bringing people of different cultures and backgrounds into into nations is great like it helps everybody learn and experience new things and then but when you just completely blow up a culture and and decimate it so that the culture doesn't exist anymore that's obviously not going to be good for anybody not for the people coming in not for the people already there it's um but again we're getting down a whole other rabbit hole there but um it's not specific to to Ireland. It's more specific to like every nation needs to like retain that culture that made them the nation that they were. Yeah, because at the end of the day, if you don't, there actually will not be any diversity. And that seems like uh, I'm trying to figure out like the correct word is a projection by the WEF class, like sort of trying to browbeat people for not wanting this to happen and calling them racist. Like you don't like diversity. It's like, well, actually it seems like the goal of these policies, whether they're, they're direct or indirect, um, and these themes that are put forth by World Economic Forum, World Health Organization, Financial uh, Action Task Force, the UN, whoever it may be, like it seems like the end goal is to actually, like you said, destroy individual cultures, which actually leads to true diversity to create this sort of um, unitary, uniform culture globally. I mean, yeah. again, people will say we're getting into like replacement theory, conspiracy theories, or new world order. But again, like you said, somebody was detached from Ireland for 14 years in return. Like it's an objective change that you've observed and yeah exactly and i and i think it's i mean again like it's a much bigger conversation to go down that rabbit hole and explain like the why's and why nots but like you maybe part of the point i was making earlier where it's like just people have apathy now they just don't really care yeah. like the government is making decisions they're bringing in aids and most people are just like yeah whatever like i don't whereas like 20 or 30 years ago Irish people may have reacted way stronger to that because they would have felt that like the Irish way of life was being attacked. Whereas now the Irish way of life is being decimated like daily. So like most people are just like, yeah, well, there is no nothing to defend anymore. It's like, we're all just like, whatever. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, if you chip away from what people felt strongly about, then like in the future, when governments come in to like stamp all over the last little bit of heritage you have like most people are just going to be oh well, it's gone anyway so like there's nothing left worth fighting for yeah no i mean and this is we talk about ireland we talk about where i grew up in northeast philly which was an irish catholic part of the city uh, my parents grew up there a very strong community in the northeast and um we began to see like things started to change in the 90s we moved to south carolina for four years and moved back to the philadelphia area but we settled uh in a suburb not where I grew up in the Northeast and very strong tight knit community culture for 30 years or longer than that, way longer than that decades, many decades post world war two. Um, and now they don't even say mass in English anymore where my parents got married, where they went to school um, right. and the neighborhoods completely gone to shit. It's like crime ridden. 
Like there's yeah. no strong community. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's weird. It's yeah, crime is one of the big things that like is a byproduct of you know splintering a society because. You mean you know yourself you talk about um i keep going back to that episode you had with that guy from the the um small towns like chuck two, Barone. like two years ago or something it was like yeah. that was like yeah that was really great because like it it explains a lot like when you have a strong community of a lot of people with similar um similar you know outlooks on life and similar like cultural um histories and and, and norms they want to protect that Right, not necessarily that like they think it's superior than any other culture, but it's like they want to protect it because that's what that's their way of life. That's what they've they've become used to, and when that gets fragmented and and broken apart, it's it's very hard for people. It, it like one of the things obviously that comes in is a lot of crime and stuff like that as well because people then really have nothing to protect. There's no kind of sense of like well, we need to like, you know, get rid of this crime because we need to protect that underlying culture. But if the underlying culture has gone, then people are more often likely to just like, you know, move out of cities or move somewhere or go somewhere else because they just don't care anymore. They're just like, well, you know, what I had there was gone, so I'm just gonna like move on, which is sad. Right? Yeah. It's like, I mean, it, it's bad that people have to have to make those decisions because of what is being like forced on them. Yeah. Um, you know, some people might say it's, it, better to be moving out of cities anyway. And I'd probably be one of those people. I don't really like cities, but that's beside the point. The point is like that, you know, it's you're, when you're, when you pull apart the fabric of what, you know, made a culture strong, then just people kind of lose that attachment to that culture. Yeah. And as it pertains to like mass immigration, whether it be in the EU or here in the United States, it's always something that's never really intuitively made sense to me is that the meme is like, they're coming to like a better place. And it's like, mm. and I think El Salvador is a great example of like a country that adopted a Bitcoin standard. Bukele came in and whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing in the way he did it, he completely solved the crime problem within a matter of years. They were the murder capital of the world. San Salvador was for many years and he came in and really cleaned it up and crime has fallen precipitously the economy is doing better and now you have the situation where if you pull uh salvadorans who have left the country over the last two decades whether or not they would come back a large percentage of them are saying yes like i plan on moving back to el mm. salvador it's finally mm. safe and i want to move back there and yeah. again bring this back to immigration policy it's something that really doesn't make sense to me it's like oh we got to save all these people from these terrible countries and the focus is never on like all right how do we make these countries a place where people don't want to leave in the first place. Yeah. I like incentivize yeah. that culture and U S foreign policy and the UN foreign policy over the last five decades has just been completely mm. destabilized and push people out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I feel like a lot of, I feel like, I feel like society in general has gone down that path of like, let's not try and fix the underlying problem. Let's just like bandaid upon bandaid upon bandaid. Um, and, and of course we see that in, you know, with central banks and fiat and as Bitcoiners, we know that well, cause it just seems to be like, you know, money printing has caused all these issues and like, oh damn, we have problems. How are we going to fix it all? Oh, let's print more money. Like, it's just, you know, it, it seems like we're just at the stage where it's like, oh, well, we know things are completely broken. Let's just keep going as long as we can. There's no like underlying, like, oh, well, let's just go back a little bit, take a couple of steps back and figure out how we can actually fix this the example you gave like let's try and fix these countries so that people don't have to leave um and you know that's probably it's probably an easier job to do it definitely is like it, it's el salvador like, did it in four years that's what i mean it's like it, it's you know it just seems like it just seems like such an easy fix it's like all right well let's just stop printing money stop printing money let's actually put yeah. criminals in jail let's yeah like <laughs> let's actually like clean up society let's actually do the right thing here but again it feels like i mean you know we can talk about california and all these places where it feels like it's just the opposite it's where like oh well like you know we can't really prosecute people anymore that's not fair so let's just let them steal up to a thousand dollars and then that's okay and we won't prosecute them it's like what <laughs> like when, what like when did that ever make sense Yes. It makes sense to a government who is running out of money and can't afford to police. 
Like that's what happens. You just end up being, oh, we're not going to police anymore. Yeah. And that's the particularly scary prospect of what's going on now where you have everybody flooding into these Western countries as they're going broke. <laughs> and you're just going to get everybody in there and be like, oh, we broke the money. Like, yeah. We yeah. don't know how to do anything. Good luck. Yeah. 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 But we're going to fix it. We're going to win. We are going to win. Yeah. We're going to win. I mean, I mean, coming back to the great orange future in Bitcoin. Yeah. And why we do what we do is because it gives us an actionable avenue through which we can build a better future for ourselves. And to do that, we're going to need infrastructure, particularly software infrastructure. Obviously, there's physical infrastructure on the mining and full node side, but mm -hmm. the ability for people to access Bitcoin, to receive Bitcoin, to send Bitcoin in ways that are at parity with the incumbent financial system is important. Yeah, and that's what yeah. you're building at Zap, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see where you're going there with this. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I mean, we don't have to go too deep into the backstory because, like, I think I probably, I probably, you know, talked about this last time I was on, and, mo and most people hopefully kind of know the backstory. But it, it Zap, right? Obviously, started because I needed a way to accept Bitcoin, um, and that was really kind of at the heart of what has been driving ZapRite from the very start is like, you need to make it very, very easy for people to accept Bitcoin. Um, and obviously, you know, with, I mean, we can talk about, you know, Parker and Will joining as well, but like, just to mention that the recent essay that Parker wrote about the, the pay me in Bitcoin theory, it's the same kind of thing. Like it's all about merchant adoption. It's, um, you know, we can't pay in Bitcoin unless the merchant is accepting, like that's just obvious, right? Um, and so that's one of the things we really need to do is like, we really need to have these tools in place that make it very easy for people to accept Bitcoin. And I probably talked about this last time I was on, but like there's, there's major things that have stopped people doing that in the past, which is like, you know, volatility and the price of Bitcoin and, and tax affairs and accounting and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, again, it just goes back to what we were, we were doing. Like we just recognize the underlying problem and fix it. And the underlying problem is, okay, if we don't have these tools, then let's just build them. And, and that's the way it is. And there's an amazing amount of things being built on, on Bitcoin right now. I mean, the like this bear market, I mean, I know it's like cliche to say it, but like the amount of the amount of work that's being done that I see being done in the Bitcoin space is like absolutely phenomenal. Like I think, you know, once, you know, another another cycle or two, like and we're just gonna have like so many different services out there that are just gonna become like second nature to people. They're just gonna do things that you know, we're a problem before and are not a problem now. Uh, and it's great to see. And of course, obviously, like that's the payment side of it is what we're trying to do at SapRite. It's just make it easier for people to accept Bitcoin and understand how their business is performing on a Bitcoin standard and then bring in tools that allow them to either spend that Bitcoin or, you know, convert it if they need to pay bills or whatever it might be. Um, but really, it's all about like building that application there and making it easier for people to, to use Bitcoin. Yeah. And going back to Parker's piece and the whole idea of merchant adoption, Dan Held would not be happy with this part of the conversation, but yeah. it is important. <laughs> and I do think Parker's piece was very, I think it could be like a pivotal piece in the history of the, the conversation around merchant adoption because it really reframed it in a way mm. that is applicable where it's not like go get every merchant to accept Bitcoin, go get the Bitcoiners who run businesses to accept Bitcoin. Yeah. Like, and one at a time, mm -hmm. you don't have to turn it on for every square point of sale system at a moment and expect everybody to accept Bitcoin. Yeah. What you really need is this base of hardened hodlers to eat their own dog food in a certain way. And if they're yeah. offering businesses and services to individuals just to have the option out there, like I accept Bitcoin. Not only that, I prefer Bitcoin. I'll yeah. give you a discount for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, again, like one of the great examples was the, the tweet you put out there recently about like the healthcare provider here in Austin, like that, that was just like a really based move. It was like, you know, I see the benefit of it. I think, you know, doing stuff like that, where you can reach individual merchants, like one at a time, who really understand what it is that they're doing and why they're making this decision. I mean, again, as, as Parker pulled it, it, it's a balance sheet decision, right? Um, at the end of the day, you recognize the superior money, you recognize the benefits of it. Um, and if you can do that, you know, for specific merchants, the Bitcoin hodlers will then come and spend. And that's one of the things that like, I kind of like, I've been, 
banging this drum for a while now that like you know huddling is great at least it has been for like you know a decade or more to to get this store of value going and get us to where we are but like you have to spend bitcoin like you have to actually use it in the economy and spend it whether you're spending and replacing or whatever it is you're doing you have to actually start using it and i know people would say like well huddling is using it is but it's not using it fully you have to use every aspect of it and some people might say oh well that will come in time you have to give like the store value more time and then things will go through natural evolution and then medium exchange and all and it's like well at what point do you like do you just sit around waiting like what what is the what is the point where it's like everybody's like oh, okay now it's a medium exchange that doesn't happen unless you actually get merchants accepting it and you get um you you get people like spending it and like you said that doesn't necessarily need to be like oh we need this on like you know a million terminals like in a city or something it just needs to be like all right one merchant okay now we have a healthcare provider now we go get a lawyer now we get a plumber now we get like the local rancher all of these little things that all of a sudden we now have these outlets to spend our bitcoin yeah um and it all starts with the merchant yeah i mean healthcare is one of them mm -hmm. <laughs> one yeah. of the most high leverage important things and oh yeah when veronica sent that message out we were stoked and then i was even more stoked when i found out she was using zap right and so we yeah. received our first invoice earlier this week on monday this week paid it and was seeing nice she's nice. happy we're happy excellent yeah it's, yeah it's amazing and reading her reading her like um you know short short i don't think it was a blog post i think she just put a, a page up on her website it's like this is why i'm accepting bitcoin um and you know obviously it it ties in a lot to healthcare like you just said it's like you know healthcare is one of the 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 low prime time preference things in your life like you've got to look after your health or you won't have your future and the way she explained why it was that like you know her her ethos and thinking behind how she runs and and her healthcare service and provides her healthcare services is it matches up and aligns exactly with with bitcoin you know she's all about like you know self-sovereignty and providing you with exactly the information that you need to make the best health decisions you can make and then obviously like recognizing the fact that people are allowed to make the best financial decisions they can make i.e using the best money and so one thing she can do to help that is like okay well i'm going to accept that money and that's just the, the clearest indicator you can get that she's really thought about this and understands exactly why she needs to do this and why it's important for her business to do this and i think we just need more of that we just need more people recognizing the, the real reason behind it not just the like oh okay like i see all these fanatical bitcoiners and maybe i'll get one or two more customers if i do this it's like no like you you need to understand exactly why you're making this decision as a merchant and once you do like there's, there's, there's no going back right? like it's just going to be it's just going to be obvious that this was the right decision that you needed to make yeah one at a time yeah emergent grassroots efforts it's not pretty yeah it's not fun at times but if this is going to be successful and we're going to have the circular economy that bitcoiners like to talk about this is how it has to happen one oh, man yeah. at a time one woman at a time yeah one healthcare provider one rancher one nation. one nation like this is it it's like oh el salvador is accepting bitcoin it's legal tender like okay great and everybody's just sitting there going who's going to be the next who's going to be the next like you know it's one at a time we're just doing it on a smaller community level like that's that's how it happens you know we're not going to all sit around and oh when is like you know when is square going to integrate like you know bitcoin payments into their terminal or like when is this going to happen it's like well we have the tools like just go to the merchant and go yep here's zap right here's ibex here's like whatever it is like you want to use like we have the tools to do it like do it now stop waiting for these other bigger companies to come with like more streamlined like you know nice like you know oh well they have these like beautiful little terminals in the shop and stuff and it's like oh we, we can solve that without that we already have the tools to fix all that stuff so yeah if not you then who yeah yeah it's uh it's exciting and it's exciting that, like going back to like building in the bear market but this adoption in the bear market is a very high signal mm -hmm. event too yes it's one healthcare provider yeah yes matt her husband is tucker Max, and <laughs> he gets bitcoin but yeah that's that's a funny thing. i'm not sure if you saw rabbit hole recap a couple of weeks ago but i did i did I, I was laughing listening to that segment it was like i was you, you, I'm still like disgusted you, yeah you almost fell off your chair i could i i it was uh, like how else do you expect this to happen matt 
Yeah, I, I, it's I'm glad you push back on that because that was one thing where as, as well I was like, Matt, what the hell? Like all these <laughs> songs, dude. Like this, like you know, like be happy. This is good. Like you know, you can't just go, oh well, that was a bitcoiner, so it doesn't matter. It's like, it, well, that's yeah. the whole thing. It's like, who do you expect to start? I mean, going back to this whole conversation with Evan for the last five minutes, it's like you can't sit around, yeah, and wait for other people to adopt Bitcoin. Like Bitcoiners have to implement it and lead by example. Mm -hmm. like, yeah 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 exactly that was yeah that was good that was a, that was a good conversation um that you guys had i'm still disgusted <laughs> we'll discuss this next week in person uh, but in terms of i mean it's been what over a year since we last talked yeah yeah but I, it was a, it was a year and a half i think it was like around buddy's day it was like march yeah. last year yeah 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 and you mentioned zap Bryce brought on parker and will to the team which has been massive and yeah. the products obviously evolved mm -hmm. a lot over the last 18 months so what have yeah yeah what have yeah. been the biggest like pain points and additions to the product um so okay so what are we doing since last march right so um last march i i wasn't too long in austin at that point um and i'd started to like raise a bit of money um 1031 the first first check-in which was like amazing um and then a little bit more and then the bear market like just quickly hit in the middle of last year and it was like okay well you know there doesn't seem to be as much money going around so maybe like i have you know i have a good lot here i'll just go and build and do the things that i want to do um and so one of the first things i did which was around uh, august really about august last year we started was I had written the original version of ZapRite, the MVP in, in React. And, you know, people tell me I'm a developer, but I don't really think I am. Like the code was absolute garbage. So we'd hired a developer to come in and kind of fix some stuff. And he was just like, no, nah, we got to rewrite this from scratch. And I was like, yeah, okay, great. Like, let's go. So that was like a, a very long process that took like, you know, over six months to, to really get it like, you know, done and done and dusted. Um, and then we pushed that live in April of this year. Um, and that was like a complete rewrite from the ground up. We moved away from Google Firebase. We have our own Postgres now. We've, um, we have we did a lot of things like separating the, the checkout away from the invoice. So now we have a separate standalone checkout that the invoice feeds into. And that allowed us to do the things like payment links, which we announced at BitBlockBoom and stuff like that, which we can get into as well, the specifics of that if we, if we need to. But um, there was a lot of a lot of work like a lot of bear market just like grinding from like basically august right through till april this year when we when we push that through and that's really like the the kind of foundation of everything we've we've we're building on right now is like that complete rewrite of the code base we have an amazing developer tom who's, who's like leading all of that and is, is still working like hardcore on that right now um so that was really great. And that allowed us then obviously to kind of like start accelerating roadmap items and, um, you know, everything else that we had that we wanted to like get in there. That was a really great foundation. Um, and it was around that time in, in you know, April, May of this year when um, kind of started, you know, having conversations with, with Parker and Will because I think they had, they had kind of stepped back from their full-time roles at Unchained and like maybe like just the end of the year before, like in November, I think it was, I can't remember, but they were kind of looking for something to do as well. Um, and they, they were looking for something in the payment space and they had very, very, very similar, um, mindset on what needed to be built and done in the payment space. Um, and they kind of like, just kind of realized that like, all right, logo, well, John's got like a hell of a lot of this already done with Zap, right? So like, let's just go and talk to him. So it kind of made sense um for them to kind of like join in and then just like accelerate the next uh, step of of zap right so yeah i mean having those two guys on board is like i mean man i'm like completely humbled like i mean if you you ask me like when i kind of like ran out of canada in september 2021 if i'd be in this position right now with like you know parker lewis and wilco coming in to join zap right i'd be like you know you're crazy but here i am and, and it's happening and it's, it's absolutely amazing because i think it's exactly what zap right needed at that point you know, we were at that point where we kind of like, all right, we've, we've kind of, we kind of proved there's a bit of a use case there still maybe searching for exact product market fit, but like, there's definitely use case. There's a growing user base The as we just talked about the, the payment space and the application space, like needs to be 
built like more um and and these guys had like a very firm vision of where that needed to like what direction it needed to go and it lined up exactly with with what i was thinking so it was kind of the timing and everything as well was great it was just like okay we've done this massive rewrite we have this solid code base we have this like loose roadmap that we need to kind of like focus where we're going next and having somebody like will to kind of step in with his background and say like all right well you know this is where i think we need to go and then having Parker come in with his business development background as well and going like, okay, well, I know how we're going to like get users and I know how we're going to like, you know, push that past that path forward. Um, so that's really been like a huge kind of a huge catalyst for ZapRite and a motivational aspect for me in particular as well, just to be like, okay, like this is kind of like, you know, a little bit of validation. Like I know, I've got something that I'm going in the right direction and having these two guys like on board to say like, yeah, we want to kind of help you with the next step has been, has been huge. So obviously like, you know, we announced that the, the announcement of those guys in uh, joining in, in end of August, like at around BIP block boom, and then announced our, like our payment links feature and our subscriptions features and stuff like that as well. So that's all kind of rolled out now as well. So now I think we're, we're in, um, Again, like I said, we're in a really great spot now where we can actually start like cracking out on all of those roadmap stuff that that we have for for the next kind of like year or two. So, what are the lowest hanging fruits on on the roadmap right now? Uh, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff like the the plugin stuff is obviously like you know that's always ongoing. We're always talking with like you know other um, Bitcoin partners like wallets, exchanges, and stuff like that, and going okay, how we can how can we plug you guys in? And how can we get like your users? you know, being able to like plug your wallets and everything seamlessly into ZapRite and, and, and help like users on both sides of that. So we're always looking at adding more plugins in, um, even on the self custody side as well. Like just we're, you know, lightning addresses, getting lightning addresses in there and being able to hook them up to people's like LND instances. So they get self custody lightning addresses, things like that. Um, all of the plugins and connection stuff is, is, is like huge. Um, and then there's all like smaller little features that we can en en enhance the um, the invoicing and the payment links as well. Because obviously the invoicing was, um, you know, they're, they're one-off payments. You send them out, they get paid once and they're done. So the payment links feature actually allows you to create um, a, a hosted payment link that can just get be purchased multiple times, right? So if you sell a book or a t-shirt or whatever it might be. So we gave that out to like Jimmy Song at Bitblock Boom, and he was kind of like the first to to use it in in the in the in the wild, like live. Um, he was selling his new book, um, Fiat Runes Everything, at, at Bitblock Boom, and so that went like really well. He was you know very impressed with it, and everything kind of like you know worked as expected, and it was great like you know to see that all you know working exactly as we we hoped it would and so there's a bunch of stuff we can add in there as well like you know adding variations on products and multiple quantities and like all that kind of stuff so there's just like you know small little features we can add to that too and then obviously one of the big things that we really want to focus on as well is the the accounting and reporting side of things right because like, as i mentioned before that's been one of the things that people always talk about as being one of the drawbacks and one of the feature requests as well that people like really really want um so that's you know that's where we can actually shine and start showing people exactly how their business is performing on a bitcoin standard um and and that's something that like you know we can um we can hopefully get a lot more of those features like built in there in the future not just our own kind of dashboards and reporting for within zapright itself but also hooking into like quickbooks and sage and zero and all these things as well um will will i think will be like huge for people yeah we were talking about this the other day in the commons like for tftc RHR, mm -hmm. like being able to hook into QuickBooks yeah, would be massive. Because right now I have my bookkeeper who yeah. gets Bitcoin but really doesn't understand it. And then I need my Bitcoin account. So shout, shout out to Joe at Satoshi Pacchioli. Yeah, um, Joe's awesome. To sort of help manage the, the Bitcoin revenue side of the thing and then cross-compute it with QuickBooks mm -hmm. that, that my bookkeeper's managing. And that's yeah. just like a clunky process where is app right quickbooks integration just being able to do uh invoices that can be paid in fiat or bitcoin via zap right hook right into quickbooks would just be like holy crap this is yeah yeah that would be a nice seamless uh integration for sure and that that's exactly where we'll head um right now 
we've got like a really comprehensive CSV export, mm -hmm. which like, to be honest, like most users are just like, you know, like just give me a CSV, like I'm good, I can deal with that, I can give it to my accountant. So we've kind of like tweaked that and revamped that and added in like a lot more stuff into that. So we actually can give users exactly what they need right now. So that kind of solves the first immediate like need to be able to give everybody exactly what they need for their accounting. And then we can, like I said, just go and make that a hell of a lot easier by doing direct integrations with QuickBooks and things like that. Because like you said, having that ability to have everything just sync immediately into QuickBooks um, is, is is ideal because the beauty of ZapRite is you've got this one unified checkout where you can, you know, your users can pay in like on chain or lightning or card and it all just goes into the into the one um, into the one accounting software rather than what I think a lot of Bitcoiners seem to be doing now is like, oh, well, if you want to pay me in Bitcoin, like here's a link to like, you know, this place over here. And if you want to pay me a credit card, like here's a link over to my like Stripe posted checkout or whatever it might be. Um, so even just the ability to pull all that into one checkout, like hosted branded checkout where you don't have to run a server and you don't have to do any of that stuff. You literally just connect your Xbox or your LND node or whatever it is. Or even if you want to just do custodial lightning with strike or something like that as well, it just makes it super simple. It's like, you know, a couple of clicks and you're immediately accepting Bitcoin in a unified hosted branded checkout that you're not running any of the server infrastructure for. Yeah. It's a beautiful it's a beautiful thing. It's the, and it's the funny thing is that going back to like what needs to be built. Many people would view this as boring, but somebody running a business, it's, it is boring to a certain extent, but it's just extremely important. And like, it, it solves, it solves an absolute need. I mean, I was scratching my own itch when I was building it. Like I was freelancing and needed to, to invoice and I, I couldn't do it. There was no proper invoicing software that allowed me to, to do what I needed to do in a self custodial manner. Um, and so when you're building something for yourself, you're obviously starting from a good place. So there's obviously a, a massive need for it. There's, there's and as, as we know now, like, you know, a couple of years down the ZapRite journey, there's obviously a whole bunch of people who felt that exact same pain point and were like, yeah, like, holy crap, okay, great. Like, this is exactly what I needed. Um, and so, you know, that's really, that's really what's kind of driving ZapRite. As, this, as I mentioned before, is like just, making it so easy for people to accept Bitcoin. And so because we're wallet agnostic and because we're not a payment processor, we don't touch the money. It's like 0% transaction fees. You're completely in control of your own money, whether you want to connect like a self custodial wallet or you want to hook up to like, you know, uh, like, like I said, strike or anybody else or like Ibex, who's like, you know, like kind of like a step in there as well. If you want somebody to manage the liquidity for you, you can do that. You can hook up a voltage node through LND or whatever it might be. Um, you really kind of have the full gamut of, of options. Um, and having and just giving people those choices means it's just going to get easier and easier for people to come to ZapRite and find exactly what they need. Yeah. And Parker and I talked about this a lot when he was talking to his, about his payments idea before officially joining ZapRite and then just like this middleware software that just connects everything, like this connective tissue yeah. that anybody can plug into. Yeah. Is, again, most people would see it as boring, but it's extremely important if we want to take this industry to the next level because everybody has their favorite wallet, uh, their preference on on-chain versus Lightning, uh, mm -hmm. their LSP providers, whatever it may be. And it's just creating a tool that any one of those user archetypes can plug into to, to accept Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. And, and even just the ability to like, switch between them as well. Um, like with ZapRite, you can customize each individual checkout for each payment link in each invoice. Like you can switch on and off whatever it is you want to have. So you might have, you know, um, you might have an LND running on like an Umbral or Start9 or something like that, um, where you don't have a huge amount of liquidity, but like it's enough for what you want to do. So you're going to switch that on for one specific thing that you want to do. But then you're like, oh, well, I need to accept like, you know, I want to sell tickets for like an event. So I need much more liquidity or I need to take a larger payment. So I'm going to switch on my strike for this checkout or whatever it might be. Um, and that's the beauty of it. Like you can actually switch LSPs and switch whatever it is you want to do. You can customize that invoice, not just for your preferred payment methods, but for, for each individual client. You can be like, well, I have a client that I know is going to pay me in Bitcoin, so I'm going to switch off the credit card option. I'm not even going to give them that option. Or maybe you have a a customer that that pays in in credit card, but you're, you've been trying to orange pill them, and so you want to get this in front of them. So you give them that unified ZapRite checkout, which shows them the Bitcoin, the on chain or the Lightning payments, and then you can actually add like maybe you want to add like a 10% premium on the credit card option. 
So now they see that and they're like, oh damn, okay, maybe I need to go get myself some Bitcoin because I'm going to save 10% on these fees because they're charging me for, for paying in dirty fiat. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about that. Let's dive into that more, that incentive mechanism to get people to spend Bitcoin like yeah. with that premium or discount, like how you frame it. Like, I, cause Parker and I talk about this a lot and he's yeah. dead set on like, no, you frame the credit card as you're paying a premium as opposed to like getting a discount for Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. And that was his talk at, at Bitblock Boom as well. Like at the end of it, I think he kind of touched on it a couple of times in the talk at the end of it. I think uh, somebody, probably Simon, I think asked him a question and he's like, well, no, you have to actually frame it as the premium on the bad money. Like that's what you need to frame it as. Um, you know, why, why should you give a discount just for accepting Bitcoin? And I mean, you know, either option is valid, right? Like, right, if you wanna, if you think that the only way you can get a customer to pay you in Bitcoin is by offering maybe like a slight discount on the Bitcoin payment, then, you know, maybe that's what you have to do. But, you know, long-term, the, the proper way to do it is say like, look, I don't want this dirty fiat because I'm gonna have to take it in and I'm gonna have to bring it to like Unchained and exchange it for Bitcoin and put it in my like custody in, in Unchained because like that's what we do as a Bitcoin company. So I'm gonna have to go through that process. So I'm gonna charge you a premium for that. And so that's kind of the way that, you know, you, you should be looking at it like long-term, but obviously like, you know, each individual um, business and user is gonna have a different way of looking at it. But yeah, how you frame it is 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 important. And, you know, framing it as dirty fiat is, you know, premium on the dirty fiat is, is a good way to do it. Could we customize the fiat line item? Like if you pay in fiat, you're paying a dirty fiat. Like really, really drive the framing home. Yeah, maybe we'll have to add that feature <laughs> in, like customize the text in the button. Yeah, do not click this. <laughs> uh, no, it's the payment links too, because I, I used the payment link to pay uh, Veronica earlier this week. And it was mm -hmm. simple. It took me 30 seconds from receiving the message, hitting the link, paying the link, and boom. Yeah. Healthcare yeah. costs covered for a month. Covered, yeah. And you get your nice little receipt and your PDF and everything and your email telling you exactly what you paid and your cost basis and everything. And then she gets the same on her side and everybody's happy. Yeah. 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 And that uh, drives home another interesting th aspect too of Bitcoin, particularly since it's a push system, like this whole idea of subscriptions and creating yeah. this new user flow of instead of setting up my debit card or my bank account and having it pulled at the first of the month like i have been historically with ultra personal health care mm -hmm. now it's this like new user flow of like all right here's a payment link and again if you're like on top of it it's not really that much of a difference yes you have to think about it and take some action clicking the link paying the invoice but is that a hurdle a ux hurdle you think could I, create barriers i don't see it as a hurdle um it's definitely not ideal. It's definitely not what people are used to, like, you know, putting in their credit card to Stripe and just being auto paid it like every month. Um, it's definitely different, but you know, it's not a massive, it's not a massive hurdle. I think, you know, the way we've built the subscriptions, our own subscriptions, because we just launched our subscriptions like $25 a month or, you know, 20% discount if you pay annually, 240 annually. Um, but the way we're doing that, like we didn't want to use Stripe or anything like that to, to manage our subscriptions. Even if we were accepting Bitcoin payments, like we didn't want to use Stripe software to manage it. So we actually built our own subscription system into Zapride, um, which will eventually hopefully release out to Zapride users as well. So they can actually start running subscription system as well. But what we're doing initially is we're just using, you know, cron jobs to send emails. It's basically like seven days beforehand, three days beforehand and, and on zero day, like you'll get emails saying like, you know, hey, reminder, your subscription's coming up and here's a link to a Zapride payment link. And then they go and pay it, boom, we extend their date and it's upright and they get another month or another year or whatever it is they paid. Um, so if we can actually start automating that in, in some way with like Bolt 12 or with like async payments or whatever it might be that like, you know, we can do in the future to automate that and take out some of those like pain points. Yeah, absolutely. Like we're going to do that. We're like chomping at the bit to, to, to be able to do some of that stuff. Um, but for now, yeah, it's just like, it's a little bit, a little bit automated. There's one or two manual steps, but Again, I wouldn't describe it as like a hurdle. I think it's just, you know, and people are kind of, you know, if they want to pay in Bitcoin, they're happy to pay in Bitcoin as well, right? So they don't mind it. It's like, uh, it's just an experience that like, okay, well, maybe I have to click this link every month to like pay every month, but it's just a kind of reminder that like, well, yeah, this is because it's self-sovereign money. I get to decide when I pay, right? Yeah. I'm not auto-charged all the time. Right? No, and then on top of that, I think, you mentioned it like user tendency with the incumbent fiat system is like, all right, I put my bank account or credit card information just pulls. Um, 
but I think the first time that somebody forgets to pay the invoice and then they go to send it a zapper an invoice and they can't because they haven't paid their subscription fee there's gonna be oh reminder the guy to pay top up it's like it's not like they're gonna stop using zapper they need to send invoices so they'll pay. yeah exactly basically what we do is if they haven't paid an invoice they've forgotten like so i mean you know realistically if somebody's just using it for invoicing they're not gonna they may not be sending invoices every single day it might be once a week or maybe at the end of the month they log in and do it all maybe they forgot to pay you know, when their subscription was due. So when they log in, they'll just see like, you know, a little message that says like, you know, they'll try and create a new invoice and it'll be like, hey, you need to pay your subscription. You forgot to pay last time before you can create a new invoice, you need to pay and it'll take them to the payment page and they can pay. So, um, you know, we, we downgrade them to a read only access. So they still have access to all of their data. They can download their CSVs. They can, you know, look at everything, download their invoice PDFs, any, um, any invoices that they have sent out can still be paid. Like we're not going to shut that off. Like if you don't pay, like we'll still any open invoices, we'll just allow be paid and come into your expo or your wallet or whatever it is. But you just won't be able to create any new ones and you won't be able to create any payment links and we'll shut down. You're like, we'll disable your payment links temporarily until you've paid, but your invoices will still, like if you sent out invoices, you can still get them paid and stuff. Yeah, I, I don't see this as being a big hurdle to adoption. Cause again, if the service is useful, which is that bright certainly is people like, all right, shit, yeah. I got to pay this $25 invoice to receive $1,000 that I'm going to send out to yeah. in receivables. Exactly, yeah. And I mean, obviously, that's one thing that we have to kind of think about as well is that how we actually charge and how we do that and, you know, what, like, how much per month we charge and what's the, what's a good rate to charge. And, you know, there have been some people who've, you know, been like, well, it's kind of high. I don't have that many Bitcoin invoices and... um you know, we get that and, and, you know, this is an evolving thing as well. Like we'll, we'll start looking at tiers and how we can accommodate more users and different things. But, you know, we had to start somewhere and because we built the subscription service ourselves, we just kind of started with one simple $25 subscription because we just needed to make sure that it worked and, and everything was like easy. Um, but as we build out that internal subscription offering, we can start to add more features to it where we can have more plans and tiers and different things, and then we can release it to the public. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we definitely opted for the value for value model, right? We're 0% transaction fees because one, because we're non-custodial, right? And we don't touch the money. So we can't actually like, you know, take in hundred percent, take 1% and give you 99. Like we just can't do that because we don't ever have access to your money. But two, because I don't necessarily like, like that model. Like I don't, I personally don't like that percentage on the volume model if it can be avoided i think it should be some places you know maybe for an exchange it makes sense because it's just you know it's it's easier way to do it um but i much prefer the value for value model where it's like hey look we've built this software if you get value from it please pay us 25 bucks a month and you can continue to access it um if you don't see value in it then you're not going to pay like that's that's okay we got to do a better job in convincing you that there is value in it but i personally think that's a much better model than taking a percentage on, on volume that goes through. Um, I think we got to prove to our users that there is value in paying that money. And if we're obviously not doing that and they're not paying, then we got to like, look at why that is, but it can't just be a simple thing of like, oh, well, it's free to use. And like, we'll just take percentage of whatever. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's all of this stuff is kind of any startup kind of goes through all this stuff as well, how to price and how to do different things. But I think um, personally as a Bitcoiner, like I just see this as, as a better way, a better way to do it. And like I said, we'll like look at different tiers and offer, offer different offerings for like personal accounts and enterprise accounts and all that kind of stuff as well. Yeah. No, I think it's a good place to start. Mm. What are you most excited about? Um, I mean, oh man, I'm excited every day just working on ZapRite. Like, I mean, it's just... It's amazing that I get to be in this position, being the founder of a Bitcoin company and working on something that I'm extremely passionate about. So like every day I just kind of like, you know, get excited about what has to be done like today, because there's just obviously like a huge long list of, of things that need to be discussed and planned and, and designed. And like, I'm still doing a lot, all the design work. Um, still a very small team. Um, but uh, so I still do, yeah, I still do a lot of the design work there's less and less time to do that because the, the, the CEO role starts to take up more and more time, um, of your, of your daily time. So eventually we'll get a designer stuff, but I still love doing design work. So like, it's great when every, like, every now and again, I can like jump in and roll up my sleeves and, and design some like new UI or new feature that needs to be done. Um, in general, 
I think I mentioned it before, but I'm just ex really excited for everything that's happening in Bitcoin right now. Like I said, the amount of like the amount of the amount of building that's been happening in the last like six to twelve months has been phenomenal. It's crazy. Like it's 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 amazing to see it. Um, and I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of that pop up to the surface now, um, you know, early next year as we start to, you know, slowly creep out of this bear market. Um, we're going to see uh, the fruits of a lot of people's work um, come to the forefront. And I think it's um, it's going to be amazing. I think we'll see a lot more of these applications that make Bitcoin easier to use. Um, and that's what kind of really excites me as a, as a designer and UI UX guys, like just all these tools that just make it easier. Um, it's it's something that it's something that I you know struggled a long time to to figure out where I could actually fit into the Bitcoin ecosystem because I wasn't like a hardcore developer I couldn't review PRs and look at like Bitcoin core code and stuff like that so it took me a long time to actually figure out where I could fit in and I guess the the the, the community itself and and Bitcoin needed to mature a little bit so that we did get to the stage where we could start building applications on top of things and so now we finally have that and now I think there's space for there's the space for every profession in Bitcoin now, like whatever it is you do, like marketer, lawyer, like, you know, social media, like whatever it is, like you can be working for a Bitcoin company now. And that, and that's amazing. Like that's, that's really great to see that there are so many roles that are available, even in the bear market. There's some people who are laying off, but there's a lot of people who are, are still hiring as well. So, um, it's great to see, it's great to see the ecosystem being, being developed to such an extent that it's starting to get more and more mainstream um in terms of like the jobs offered and the applications that are being built and everything as well on top of it. it's great to see yeah i think the the building that's happened in this bear market i've said it on many shows in recent months is far beyond anything i've experienced in my first 10 years in bitcoin and to your point like the companies that are working to make it easier to use bitcoin like zap right and other companies on the lightning network um and even down the hall unchained what they just launched with their keyless yep. enterprise offer um, others come into market and it's just extremely exciting taking into consideration everything that's happening in the global macro world the having on the horizon and the fact that uh, the next hype cycle that comes i truly believe that the industry i mean this is a fact two ways it's mature mature than it's ever been because it's older than it's ever been but like the actual like tools that people can leverage like bitcoin's going to have a lot more to show off during the next hype cycle where it's not going to be people going on coinbase and buying and following the charts they're gonna be able to go on an exchange send it to a wallet and then play with it on podcasting 2.0 or accepting mm -hmm. uh, bitcoin as payment for their business and all these other interactions that did not exist during the last cycle yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's, that's key to it is, is the ability for more people to integrate Bitcoin into their daily lives, whether it's a, a business or their personal lives, I think it's just getting easier and easier. Um, and, and it's great. Yeah. I love to see it. Yeah. Are you happy to be back in Austin? Yeah, I definitely am. It's, um, it's good. Yeah. It's, I, I don't, I wasn't sure how I'd feel coming back cause I came back in, in June for a month and now i'm here again for like you know best part of a month and it's uh it's great there's this there's a special vibe in austin it's um you know it's amazing just like you know walking back into the comments here and just seeing you know just you know seeing everybody just like doing their thing and and you know really creating um is, is amazing and then we had abc last night as well so it's good to be back for these meetups and we'll have bit devs and stuff like a couple of weeks down the line and it's um yeah it's definitely special special place to be and i love i love being here yeah i'll have to come back full time yeah uh, well as i was just going to go into i feel like we're in similar positions where i feel this vibe in austin where things are happening is very strong but i also feel that pull from my family up in the northeast and like getting yeah. back to my roots and it's like ah uh, yeah family's huge and that's kind of that's kind of what i've gone through in the last while as well as uh i mean i kind of mentioned it earlier where i had to leave and go back to Ireland while I was waiting on the visa. And obviously I hadn't lived there for 14 years and just going back and, you know, just meeting new people and hanging around with like family, you know, my parents are there, they're not getting any younger, being able to spend like months with them is like, it's, you know, it's amazing. It's, you don't like, you kind of, you don't realize it, but like it took, 
it took me a while to get there. Like it took, I was out for dinner with some friends one night and they basically just said like, you know, I was chomping at the bit to get my work visa and get back over to Austin and get going again. And I was kind of getting fed up that it was taking so long and I was waiting on the US embassy in Dublin and like, I was just getting frustrated. And my friends kind of just looked at me and said, John, like your visa will come, forget about it. Just enjoy the time that you're spending with your parents and your family here. Cause like, you know, I've got nieces and nephews and stuff that like I haven't obviously seen in, you know, a long time. I met like a three-year-old niece that I hadn't met before when I went back like in November and everything. So it was like, you know, it's great. And then obviously like this, the, the Bitcoin startup scene that's happening in Ireland as well. Like it kind of like, when I went over there after being there for like, you know, seven, eight, nine months, it's like, you start to feel this pull and this draw and it's like, oh damn, okay. Like this is a feeling that I haven't had in Ireland for like a long time. And family is a huge, like strong part of that as well. Um, but it, it feels like I have a kind of family here in Austin as well. And that's like kind of hard. Like, you know, when I had to leave in November, it's like, I felt like I'd made such amazing friends and met so such amazing people that leaving them, like it, it was tough. And then you go back and you get that same thing with your family. Mm -hmm. You're just like, oh man, I gotta leave my family and go back over to Austin. And it's like, I mean, look, I mean, we're talking about like first world problems, right? Like it, it's, yeah. I, I, I'm, I am blessed to be able to bounce between these countries. Like I have a Canadian passport. I'm obviously Irish. I have a work visa for the US. Like there's not a lot of people who can, who can say that. So I, I know the position I am in, but again, like it's, you know, it's, it's decision time. Yeah. It's decision time. No, I feel too. I mean, we make our pilgrimage to the shore every summer. We're there for two or three months with our families, like literally three generations, one house, 10 of us. Mm. And then my cousins, my extended families, on the island, my kids are hanging out with my cousin's kids, my mom, my brother and sister. And then we come, vibes. And then we come yeah. back here and it's like, oh God, we missed that. But then we're in the commons and the vibes are high. People are working yeah. and there's all this energy here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just this weird thing Like going back to what we were saying earlier. It's like, I don't know, I toil with it internally too. Like I, I, Parker sold me pretty hard. You gotta fall back to Austin, build Bitcoin and then go back to where he came from and sort of build it up there. Well, maybe that's it. Maybe it's just like, you know, bouncing between the two. Yeah. Right? You can have the best of both words. And then that's kind of where I am right now. It's like, I'm kind of looking at this idea of like, okay, maybe do I put some roots down in Ireland and then just like keep traveling over to the US for like, you know, a month or two at a time and doing some work in Austin and then going back to Ireland and hanging out. Like, I mean, it's, it's a valid option, but at the same time, like the older you get, like you kind of get tired you get tired of traveling like man it's just like those those eight or nine hour flights like over the atlantic are killer like it's i don't even like traveling to bitcoin conferences in the united states yeah i like, kind of it, it's people are like how come you aren't going to this conference it's like just too many goddamn conferences number one number two yeah like i don't yeah, like yeah. traveling i don't like sleeping in hotels i don't like any of that yeah i'm kind of getting i mean it seems weird to say i'm kind of getting jaded of conferences because i haven't been to too many but it took me a long time to go to my first Bitcoin conference. Like I've been in Bitcoin since like, you know, 2013 and it was 2022 20, Miami was my first Bitcoin conference. And I kind of got disillusioned with that because that was like a little bit shit coinery and like there was too many people there. And I was like, oh, okay, like, and I, I've been recently been to Baltic Honey Badger. That was amazing. Like Riga's great. That's a great conference, like a lot smaller, more intimate, like amazing people. Like, and that was, that was good. And it was, you know, it was a lot closer to Ireland and stuff as well. So I was able to go. Um, but I am getting to the stage where I'm just like, I don't know, like these are just going away for like three or four days. These conferences, like it's exhausting. Like Hanging there's, out there's with a the same lot, people. Like, it's like, we need to go out. Like, well, yeah, this is one of the things as well. I think why I might've been so disillusioned with Miami is that like I was living in Austin at the time. And then there was like about 50 of us that just went from Austin to Miami and I just hung around with the same people. I was just like, like, what's this? All? I just create like paid thousands of dollars to stay in Miami in this accommodation, like to hang around with the same people. Like, it's, it didn't make any <laughs> sense, but you know, it's good to experience a few of them. And then, um, but yeah, you kind of get like a little bit jaded after a while. It's like, and it's like, know, how did you have all these people get this work done? You're gonna yeah. like every conference is like, hey, wait a second. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there, you know, you can, I've heard Matt talk about this as well. It's like, you gotta be more selective and you've said it before, you gotta pick and choose the ones that you go to and you gotta kind of scale back a little bit because, you know, after a while there's, there's not as much benefit to be had from doing the- The circuit. The circuit, yeah. Yeah, no, I definitely, 
have my short list. Baltic Honey Badger being one of them. I had to miss this year for the first time, but that's Oh, have you been to them all so far except this year, yeah? I think except two. I don't think I went to the first ever. Nice. But after that, yeah, I, I've been to three or four. I think there's been five yeah. or six. Yeah, yeah. It's been a few. Yeah. That was the first one I was at, but yeah, really, really impressed. Shout out to Max and yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. the rest of the team at Hoddle Hoddle. Yeah, they did a great job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's been awesome. It's great to catch up, man. Yeah, it is. Thanks for having me on. It's been uh, it's been amazing to be to be back in Austin and back on the show. So thanks for having me. Yeah. Oh. You've got the open invite whenever you want to come. We can talk. Appreciate that. We can talk immigration policy, uh, yeah, yeah. Irish heritage, whatever, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Whatever yeah. we fancy. We don't maybe have to talk about Bitcoin all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe we can get deeper on some other topics. But uh, yeah, no, it's been good. It's been good to be... Uh, it's been it's been good to you know at least to kind of touch on some of that stuff because uh, I think there's a strong Bitcoin community growing in Ireland right now and uh, it's great to see like the effort of like Gary and, and other folks over there who are doing like really really solid work and like I said meeting a couple of founders from like new Irish Bitcoin startups and stuff is really really promising so fingers crossed that's you know that's gonna just keep getting better and better. No, I, I mean that's one of the beauties of RHR particularly like the shout outs and the boost that we read is develop this culture of people like pump, pimping their local meetups. If you're out there and you don't have a meetup, go start one. Hey. Oh yeah, man. I'm like, I'm banging that drum all the time. Like there's uh, like, I say it to everybody who listened to me, every podcast I come on and everything. It's like, the, the, you cannot overestimate the, the, the benefits of getting together face to face as, as Bitcoiners and discussing all this stuff. Um, whether it's a local meetup or a hackathon or like a community event or whatever it might be, if there's no, if there's no meetup in your area, start one. Like, even if it's just like three guys who go for a beer or three gals or whatever, like just like, just start it and get some people together and like, it, it will, it, it will grow from there. Um, and, and I think there's, there's huge opportunities to be had when you start attending these meetings and meeting different people and networking and stuff. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it, it's how ZapRite got to be where it is it was me moving down from Canada, moving to Austin and going to the like bit devs and ABC and everything like month after month, hanging out at Pleb Lab and Commons and stuff like that. That's how I got my start. And I, I just can't like, you know, overstate it. It's been, it's been absolutely amazing. So I highly, highly recommend like meetups, start one for sure. Yeah. And then going back to what we were talking about earlier, like it's gotta be Bitcoiners driving this adoption at the grassroots level. And you can argue that even before that, like, point of going to merchants and getting them to accept Bitcoin or having Bitcoiners accept uh, Bitcoin as merchants themselves. Like you need these meetups where people can go learn how to actually do it. Like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like huge amount, uh, huge amount of knowledge out there that Bitcoiners are willing to share. So yeah, just, just get in there and, and learn it, absorb it. John, it's a pleasure. Should be a fun week next week. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be good to see some uh, amazing folks again. Uh, it's Last year was great. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, uh, I think I might have a beer. It's 4.30 on a Friday. I think this is episode number four or five we've done this week. Yeah, you deserve Podcasts it. Podcast in totality. Yeah. Let's go have let's, a beer. Let's Yeah, let's go grab a pint of Guinness. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, peace and love, freaks. Ding-ding.